Hey, Sean here at Grim Cycles, and today we're doing a workshop on understanding charging systems. I've been in the business for 20 years fixing Harleys, and we decided to put these workshops together to show you how to correctly diagnose and fix your motorcycle. There's no guessing to what we do as mechanics, and I thought that we'd share some of the tips and secrets to help you save time and money so you can do it yourself and do it right. Okay, so let's say you ride all the time, man. Everything's fine, and then one day maybe you're heading home from work and you notice a little spitting and sputtering. Maybe your headlight seems a little dimmer than normal and you don't think much of it, and the next morning you wake up and your bike doesn't start. Maybe you turn your key on and you've got a headlight, but it just won't seem to turn the bike over. Or maybe you're out on the road and you lose a headlight altogether, and then slowly but surely it starts running really bad and stops running altogether, and you've got to call and get a tow truck to get your bike home. Um, those are all symptoms of charging system issues and in this video we're going to explain in great detail not only how the system works but all the different components and how to test it so we can save you time and money and get you back out on the road as quickly as possible. Okay aside from having some basic hand tools you're going to need a service manual. It'll have all the specs in it. Uh, Harley Davidson manuals I find to be the best and most accurate. If you're going to be working on your bike it's a must-have item. The next thing is just a maintenance item. A lot of people don't use them, but if you plug your bike into a battery tender, it'll help extend the life of your battery, help keep it at peak charge, and it'll help keep from stressing your charging system over the life of your battery. So there's some preventative stuff. The next and most important thing would be your multimeter. The multimeter is going to have um, all the features and functions that you'll need to test, all the circuits we're going to talk about. You can get some cheap ones, and those are okay. They're not as accurate, but for the intents and purposes of this video, any multimeter will allow you to test the circuits we're going to be testing today. And then a load tester to test your battery. This actually puts a load on the battery to see if your battery can hold a load, and we'll discuss this later. You don't necessarily have to have one of these. I'm going to show you some tricks on how to sort of fake a load test on the bike to get an idea if your, bike, if your battery will hold a load. All right, so in the next section, we're going to discuss basic electrical principles and terminology that will help build a solid foundation moving forward. Okay, so there's two types of electricity we need to discuss, AC volts and DC volts. AC volts, or ACV, stands for alternating current. And on a sine wave that we have here, it means that electricity is produced and travels in one direction. It stops and goes the other direction, alternating current. Alternating current is produced by induction, which is simply the manufacturing of electricity, and it takes three things. You'll need to have a coil of wire, a magnetic field, and the motion of that magnetic field. Okay, on your bike, so you have the two major components that are your stator and your rotor, your rotor being the magnet, your stator being the coil of wire, the conductor, and the motion of that, that rotor spinning around your stator, is what creates alternating current, or AC volts. All right, DC volts is electricity that moves in one direction. As on my little graph here, it simply moves in one direction. It's expressed as DCV. Um, your battery and all the components on your motorcycle are work on DC volts. Okay, resistance is another word that we're going to use a lot over this next segment. Resistance is measured in ohms, and this is a symbol for ohms here. Resistance simply means resistance to flow or impediment to flow. It either slows down or stops flow. We have to have resistance to make electricity work, to make it actually do something. An example of that would be a turn signal, your tail light, or your horn. All things in a circuit that require, res that, that make resistance and allow us to realize electricity. So another important term would be polarity. Polarity simply means the direction of current flow whether it's AC volts or DC volts. And conventional electrical theory states that electricity flows from positive to negative. So the next thing we need to talk about is continuity. Continuity simply means the ability of a device to pass electricity. So it either has continuity or it doesn't have continuity. A closed switch like this one has continuity, but if I open it, it breaks the circuit and it has no continuity. Switches are great examples of continuity, and a good example would be your kill switch. When your kill switch is on, it has continuity, and it's passing voltage to your coil. When you flip your kill switch off, you're disconnecting that switch, and it has no continuity at that point. Okay, so obviously one of the major components of your charging system is your battery. Batteries store DC voltage. They don't make voltage, which I think is important to note. 
Batteries are comprised of a series of lead plates that are separated by a sheet of insulator. In this battery, you can actually see the lead plates and the insulator. And what that does is create an environment along with the electrolyte, which is a mixture of sulfuric acid and distilled water, uh, creates an environment for electricity to be stored. All right, so traditional lead acid batteries. This is kind of the first uh, battery here. These are vented. They will lose electrolyte because of evaporation, so they are a maintenance battery. You'll need to check them. They traditionally have lower cold cranking amps than other types of batteries. Um, even if maintained well, the best you're going to get is a year or two out of one of these. So this is kind of the most basic form of battery, typically used in smaller engine stuff. Definitely don't recommend putting one of these in your Harley. Okay, so the next in line is your maintenance free battery. Like the lead acid battery, they will come dry. These come typically with a pack of acid that you will pop on top, and then after the acid drains in, you'll seal them up, and these will need to be charged. I didn't mention before, or I think it's important to note, that you want to charge both of these batteries 24 hours on a low amperage charger to make sure they get full battery voltage before you use them. The maintenance free batteries have a little higher cold cranking amps. There's no maintenance to them as far as having to fill electrolyte. Um, they don't last as long as our glass absorbed mat, but they're kind of the next progression in battery. Okay, the next in line, and definitely the one you're probably gonna use most often in a bigger bike like your Harley, is the absorbed glass mat. This brand, is, particular brand is DECA, and it has the same sort of plate construction inside, but the major difference with these is a full molded case construction. They are maintenance free and they come activated from the factory. The absorbed glass mat, when they inject the, elect the electrolyte into it, the mat absorbs and expands. And also in between each one of these plates and this one, they're packed nice and tight to help reduce vibration. You know, when you get a cheaper battery, something like this, and especially in a bike like a rigid or uh, a big inch bike that vibrates a lot, what happens is these plates separate and short out, and that's when cells go bad. So good quality batteries like this are designed with molded lugs, solid plate construction that help reduce uh, the possibility of, of the internals of the battery coming undone on you. One of the great things about the absorbed glass mats is that they can be turned in just about any direction. They have really high cold cranking amps, um, and they typically, if well maintained, get three to five years out of them. Okay, and then the new technology for batteries is lithium ion. I don't have an example here, but uh, we're an anti-gravity battery dealer and we use them quite a bit. They're super light. They typically have two to three times the cold cranking amps of even your high output absorbed glass mat batteries. They do require a special charger, so do not use a traditional trickle, trickle charger on those. You're going to want to buy a special one if you are running one of those. Uh, they can be mounted in any position. They come in small cases and full-size cases, and they are are 80 percent lighter than any of these batteries here. Okay so there's three major types of charging systems. There's a the half wave, the full wave, and the three phase. Harleys are comprised mainly of full wave so that's what we're going to discuss in this application. Stators, as I stated before, manufacture AC volts and I have two examples of stators here. This is a sealed one and this is an open one. This is more common. Uh, these get warm and fail a little quicker. Uh, so we have a steel core that's wrapped in a copper wire, and this is the conductor in the induction process. Induction is what manufactures AC volts. Now these are your rotors. They're magnetic. You can see the magnets on the inside here, and these actually spin around the stator, and that's what creates our AC volts. Okay, your stator and your rotor are typically found on the big twins, found on the left side under the primary cover, and they are attached to the motor. Sportsters sometimes attach the motor and sometimes they're attached behind the clutch. They made a couple different changes there over the years. Uh, either way, they're both on the left side of the bike and under the primary cover. Okay, another thing interesting to note, since we can actually see the stator out here, is the coils of wire are separate from the steel core. They're actually insulated from the steel core, and that way all the, all the voltage is passed out of these two leads. What you do not want is continuity from the steel core to the copper windings. So in a situation like that, all the excess voltage would bleed to ground and it would make this stator bad. Full wave systems use a solid state regulator. When the regulator is turned off, 
it's passing a full AC wave through the regulator into the battery. When the regulator is turned on, it only uses half of the sine wave. Uh, all the excess voltage is passed to ground, and a full sine wave in a full wave system doubles the AC output. Okay, so the final component in your charging system is the rectifier regulator. Just as a side note, in the past, in earlier motorcycles, these were two separate units. There was the regulator and the rectifier. And these new solid state units, they're all in the same thing. So what a regulator does is it actually converts the AC voltage from your stator to DC voltage that your battery can use. And I thought it would be good to show the connection here on Harleys in the front there where these two plugs are, this is all you'll see from your stator sticking out of the case and this plug connects in like so. Okay, so these are comprised of, inside of these are bridge rectifiers and diodes that direct current and convert it from AC to DC. Uh, they're an aluminum case. It's very important to note that the ground connection is through this case into your chassis, so you need to make sure you have a good clean connection there. They're also thin because these build heat, and they're noticed most of the time they're mounted in the front of the bike. This will help dissipate heat and keep them cool. There's only three wires here. You have the two that hook up to your stator and the one that goes up to a circuit breaker on your battery. Uh, and essentially it's a direct connection, but you want to have a circuit breaker there in case this wire gets cut. It's a high amperage, high voltage wire. And uh, without a separation there, you can cause a, a meltdown if that were to go straight to ground. Okay, so as a recap, we have the three major components. We have your stator and rotor. We have your regulator, rectifier, and your battery, and that basically comprises your complete charging system. They are independent of everything else on the bike. They manufacture electricity and store electricity. So your stator manufactures AC voltage that your rectifier regulator then rectifies into DC voltage and regulates the amount of voltage to your battery, and your battery stores DC voltage for use on the rest of the motorcycle. Okay, so we've gone over some basic electrical principles. We've discussed all the different components and how they work. And so now we're going to do some static tests on batteries. I figured some bench test stuff would be a good place to start. I can show you some things to look for and how to use these tools. What we've got here is our meter set. To, uh, this particular meter actually is set to volts. And then I've got a button that changes it from AC volts to DC volts. So we're set on DC volts because we're measuring a battery. And the first thing you're going to do is positive to positive and negative to negative, and let's take a reading. A good battery voltage is between 12.5 and about 13 volts. And as you can see, this is a shop battery that we use all the time. And you can see it's sitting at 12.9. Okay. So the next step in the process would be actually testing the battery to see if it'll hold a load. Believe it or not, some batteries can show that they've got good battery voltage, but when you apply a load to them, they dump and you can't, and they won't hold a load. So that's where this load tester comes in. It also doubles as a volt tester. It's a DC volt tester too. If you can see here, it's showing that we're registering about 12 and a half or so volts on the meter. And the actual test is to press a button. It's going to apply a load to the battery and you count 15 seconds. You'll watch it drop. And if it stays within nine and a half volts or higher, you're good. If it drops below that, you may have a bad battery. So I'm going to go ahead and show you what that looks like. So that's 10 th seconds right there, and you can see how it's dropped, maintained a load, and you can see how much amperage that draws on the back here. It actually, it actually will get red hot, believe it or not. So anyway, this is a good battery. It's nice and solid and holds a load. On this next one over here, I'm going to show you what it would look like when it can't hold a load. Okay, so this is just a regular lead acid filled battery and what we did was we filled this but I did not actually put it on charge. And I did that so that you can see in some cases you can measure your battery voltage and it'll say, hey look, I got 12 volts but if you apply a load to it, it'll drop and this is what that will look like. You can see how it won't even begin and over time watch that needle drop. Okay, so we ran some static tests on both of these batteries. You can see how this one showed that it had good voltage and it held a load. This one had pretty good voltage, but it did not hold, hold a load. Uh, if you come into a situation like that, don't assume your battery's bad. What we do is we'll throw the battery on a trickle charger for 24 hours. Then we'll run through those same tests again. If at that point it doesn't hold a load, you do in fact have a bad battery. Now not everybody has a load tester and so later on in the segment I'm going to show you how to do a mock load test on your bike using your starter as a load tester. 
So what we have here is two stators. They're both full waves out of a Harley, and I do have the bottom end of a Harley motor here. I thought it'd be good to show you, if you haven't seen before, how and where the stator goes. So the stator bolts on through here, and this plug slips through this, this hole in the case. These mounting bolts bolt directly to the case, and this metal is transferred directly to the case also. And that's important so that you can understand the grounds. So ground between this and the case, but you don't want grounds between the coil and the case. So what we'll do now is I'll show you how to statically test a stator. You're going to switch your meter to ohms. And then the first thing you're going to do is stick both leads, or one lead in either side of the two holes here. I don't know if you can see that, like that. And what you're looking for is this is point zero, anything point eight and under. And that's where your service menu will come in and you'll actually look at those specs. It'll give you a parameter. So if you're looking at this here, that looks to be good. Then what I do, it's redundant, but I always double, I always switch the leads and do another check. It's essentially the same thing, but why not be super sure? So then I take one lead out and how we were talking about grounding, I'm gonna check this and what you do want your meter to read is open line, infinity. Some meters read differently, but what it's saying is that there's no connection, no continuity between this lead and this lead. So you know that there's no ground between these coils and this steel core, which is a good thing. That's what you're looking for. And then I always switch and check the other side too. Now this is a sealed unit here, and we'll move over and do the same checks here. So we're going to check continuity here and get a resistance reading, and there's point 0.1. Well, there's a good example. That looks like a good stator, so we're going to go ahead and check. We'll do the switch like I told you to do, just to double check, and then we're going to pull one meter lead, and we're going to go to ground. Well, you can see instantly we have continuity between leads, and just for the hell of it, let's check the other side too. So right off the bat, in a static bench test, you can tell that this stator is no good. Anytime you have continuity between one of the, the full phase wires and a ground, then it's no good. Okay, so here we have a couple sets of rotors. This one is off a of Harley and this is off an early Jap bike. And the reason why I picked these is because this is a sealed style magnet system and this is an open magnet system. And really, when you're looking at these, you just want to inspect a few things. It's important that the splines are nice and solid and they're not beat out. If there's an issue there, the rotor's bad. If you have any cracks or any loose magnets, it's a bad rotor. And it's really that simple. Some Harleys have separated magnets like this one, and so I wanted to show you that if any of these magnets were to move, then it would be a bad rotor. These are supposed to be stuck in place, and I have seen these where they chip, uh, they will move around, and that can cause some serious damage to not only the rotor, the stator, but engine cases also. So when you have the rotor off, be sure to do a visual inspection to make sure that these are solid and good to run. All right, so we've been through all the basics and now we're finally working on the bike. Uh, here I've got a 95 Fat Boy that we're going to do some tests on. So just like the bench test earlier, we're going to go ahead and do a static test but on the bike. Simply touch your positive to positive and negative to negative and make sure your meter's at volts DC. Remember reading it direct current. So right now you can see this has 12.8 volts. Uh, if you remember from earlier, we said 12.5 to 13 means you've got a good battery doesn't mean that it's not going to be, have the capacity to hold a load. So we're going to do a load test. And I'm saying not everybody has a load test, so we're going to do a couple things here to show you a few ways to see if this battery is going to be good. If you turn the bike on, turn on your high beam, make sure you've got all your stuff running, you can see we're losing a little voltage over here. So what I like to do, really, that's just sort of a preliminary test. The starter draws a good load. So if you go ahead and hit your starter button, and uh, we'll watch and see what happens here. Well, there you go. On the actual load meter, the test was 15 seconds. You don't want to do that on your bike, but a starter draws a lot. And I tell you what, if it's holding nine, nine and a half volts on something like that, this battery is capable of holding a load. You've got a good battery. A couple other things you want to look for while you're here is make sure you've got good terminals that are nice and tight. Uh, there's nothing loose and there's no frays or anything rubbing. Be another good point to check out while you're standing here. Okay, so we showed you how to do a static test on the battery on the bike and a mock load test on the bike. 
The next thing we're going to do is a running test to see if we are in fact charging. So normal parameters for a charging system is between about 12 and a half volts all the way up to 15 volts. You never want to see a charging system go over 15 volts and you really don't want to see it under 12 and a half volts. So what we'll do is we'll take our positive to positive, our negative to negative. We're going to make sure that our meter is marked at volts DC and we're going to take a reading. And right now we're at 12.8. The next step we're going to start the bike and do it at idle and then we're going to crack it up to about 2,000 RPM to see how much it's charging at that point. Okay, so you can see there at Idaho we're about 12.6, and I think we went up to about a 13 and a half when I cracked it up to about 2,000 RPM. So obviously this is a good charging system. We're actually making voltage, and at Idaho we're maintaining voltage. A symptom of a bad charging system would be at idle we were actually losing voltage or we were below 12 and a half and as you cracked it up as the stator started producing what should be producing more voltage it doesn't move at all or it creeps up to less than 12.8 or so it means it's a really weak system so the la the other thing you really don't want to see is where you start charging over 15 volts that's dangerous it can start burning up other electrical components on your bike so if you do this test and you're not at 12.6 to 15 volts in between those parameters, chances are you've got a charging system issue and we're going to move forward here to check the rest of the components. Okay, so we started with the battery. We determined that that was good. We know we have a good battery that can hold a load and so now we're going to move on to do some stator checks. Just like on the bench before, we did some static checks and now I'm going to show you what that looks like on the bike. So from 1970 until present, all your big twin stator plugs are going to be here. Your newer bikes are a little different configuration, but they're all mounted here. You've got your regulator up front. So the first thing you're going to do is disconnect this, this connection here. And you're going to look at these plugs. And you can see on this one, the regulator's actually got a little bit of deterioration there. The regulator plug does. So we'll worry about that later. We'll push this off to the side. Turn your meter to ohms. And we're going to do the same thing like we did on the bench. You're going to stick both meter leads, one in each hole, and we're going to take a reading. This is where your service manual comes in. Always look to your service manual to check your specs. It'll give you a parameter, and you're going to want to follow those parameters. So right now we're reading zero ohms, and we're going to do the switch, like I said. It's redundant. It's not necessary. I always do it. There we go. So now we're going to check the ground. So Right now, the stator checks out good as far as resistance goes, and so we're going to make sure that it doesn't go to ground. Anywhere on the case, I like to use the engine case because as I showed you in the example before, the stator bolts directly to the engine case. So if you do have a ground issue, it's going to show up very clearly if you use any point on the engine case here or the primary cover. And you can see there we've got an open line or an off line, meaning we have no continuity between these two leads, which means there's no ground the stator's not going to ground. Same thing, we're going to move our red lead over to the top and do another check too. Very redundant, there's no sense in not double checking. Okay, so right there that shows that the static test is positive, we have a good stator. It can actually fail in the dynamic test and that's what we're going to show you how to do next. The next thing we're going to do is do a dynamic test and make sure that it's performing within the parameters. And that's where you're going to look to your service manual to check those specs. So the first thing we're going to do is turn our meter to volts. And mine has a button that changes from DC to AC. So we're going to want to make sure that we're on AC volts. Remember, the stator makes AC volts. So that's what we're going to be measuring here in this segment. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we are going to turn a meter to volts AC. We're going to take both leads, put one in one side and one on the other side, and then we're going to start the bike. At idle, we're going to take a measurement. You're going to see what happens here, and then we're going to crack it up to 2,000 RPM and take another reading. And what you should see is roughly on this particular bike, 
once again, refer to your service manual. This particular bike is 16 to 20 volts at idle, and it should come up to around 40 or 50 at about 2,000 RPM. Your book will specify that in the electrical section of the manual, and so you'll want to cross-reference that to your particular model. So what we're going to do now is start the bike and show you what that looks like in a real live test. Okay, a couple things we should talk about while we're here. On some of these stators, it's a molded plug with these uh, steel inserts in here. And what I've noticed on some of them is those inserts are a lot further down and below the, the rubber. On this one, it's fine, but on some of them, they aren't. And so what I will do is I'll take a razor blade and actually shave that off so that the metal is flush with the outside of the rubber here. And what that will do is give you a good solid connection between this and give you the most penetration too. So if you're looking at your stator plug arrangement and it's like that, never hurts to shave that off so that you get a little bit more engagement there. The next thing is these are notorious for coming off. Um, there's actually a little stator hold down uh, wire that you can buy that will bolt off this mount and hold that. But what I find is a zip tie, if you've got a good connection, if you just take your zip tie and do one of these around there, will help keep it on there nice and solid. A couple things to look for. Um, on the Evos, it's fairly notorious, like I was saying, for this happening. I also, on shovel heads, I usually upgrade them to these 32 amp stator systems. Um, real common and uh, real easy to get when you're on the road, too, if you have a regulator or something go out on you. All right, so now we've checked our battery. We know that it's good. We moved on to our stator. We did both static and dynamic checks on that, and it's proved to be good. The next thing we're going to look at is our regulator. So by process of elimination, there's only three major items in your charging system. If you've got a good battery, you've got a good stator, and most likely default is you've got a bad regulator. Really the major check you want to do here is make sure that it's grounding to your frame. If you don't have a good ground between your stator and your frame, it can't pass that excess voltage off the ground. So what you're going to want to do is turn your meter to ohms and you're going to do a couple checks and I like to go to the engine case. So I put my meter lead on the voltage regulator and then I go to a known ground and I like to use my motor. So right there we're showing that we have very little resistance, which is a good sign. You want to have as little resistance as possible, meaning you have a nice, smooth, even flow between the regulator and the chassis ground. So if you check that and you've got a good ground there, you know you've got a good stator, you know you've got a good battery, your regulator is at default. Now there are a couple more complicated checks that take some expensive equipment to check that, but in 20 years, every time I've ever checked it this way and determined that uh, the stator's good, the battery's good, it's always the regulator its fault. So if you go through these steps, simple, follow the protocol, you'll come up with a solid answer and you'll know that you need a new regulator and not a stator in the future. All right, so at this point we've discussed charging system symptoms, general terminology, and electrical principles. We've showed you all the charging system components, how to test them both statically and dynamically on and off the bike. That'll give you all the knowledge you need to do it yourself, do it right, save yourself some time and money. Please be sure to check out GrimCycles.com for more of our videos and any of the parts you might need for your bike.